Good afternoon, everyone. I am Rahul Gosain. And I'm Rohit Gosain. And we are Oncology Brothers. Today, we would like to welcome Dr. Eric Singhi, an assistant professor and a practicing thoracic medical oncologist at the MD Anderson Cancer Center. In our discussion, we hope Dr. Singhi will walk us through his approach in treating non-small cell lung cancer so that we can reiterate the current standard of care practice in our community settings. Without further ado, let us welcome Dr. Eric Singhi. Hi, thanks so much for having me. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Singhi, to join us. We have divided the non-small cell lung cancer algorithm into three parts, stage one to stage three, where the treatment is with curative intent, then stage four, with or without actionable mutation. Our focus today will be on advanced metastatic non-small cell lung cancer with no actionable mutations in the first line setting. Here's that subset and stage is all yours. Okay, great. Yeah, thanks. Excited to kind of see the series that you guys have. And I know that you mentioned you have a separate video that's dedicated to just explaining the management of patients with metastatic non-small cell lung cancer who have an actual mutation, but do want to stress that's very imperative before we go down this algorithm of patients that do not have an actual mutation that we have performed complete comprehensive next generation sequencing, particularly our patients with adenocarcinoma histology. And then once we know for sure that there is no actual mutation, that's kind of the next big step in the decision making process. So making sure that the tissue that's been obtained from biopsy undergoes immunohistochemistry staining and testing for pdl one testing is imperative, especially to calculate a tumor proportion score, the TPS, which we'll be referring to here. So I think kind of the best way to start off with this algorithm is to take a look at the group that you have below. So the patients that are high PDL1 expression, meaning a PDL1 TPS of 50% or higher. So this group of patients is about a third of patients that you're going to see in clinic in the metastatic setting. And we have several options that you can see listed here that I'm going to go through. I think the go-to choice for these patients that you're going to need to keep in mind is single agent immunotherapy. And we have a few options for single agent immunotherapy that have now been approved. So first we have single agent pembrolizumab and the strongest data that we have comes from the Keynote 024 study. What it did was it restricted enrollment to patients with a high pd one expression of at least 50% and did demonstrate a significant PFS and OS benefit for pembrolizumab alone as compared to platinum based chemotherapy. Of course, now we have approval in the space for single agent atezolizumab, most recently semiplumab monotherapy too, which is just another PD-1 inhibitor. Thank you for walking us through this algorithm, Dr. Sengi. Studies have shown that we still lack NGS testing for our non-small cell lung cancer patients in the community. Do you perform NGS testing in all your non-small cell lung cancer patients, whether squamous or adenocarcinoma? Any preference over tissue versus liquid or DNA versus RNA testing? Yeah, I think these are great questions that come up all the time in clinical practice. So actually I've kind of moved my next generation sequencing into earlier stages as well. We do have approvals, and as I'm sure you'll mention in your other videos, for testing in actually resectable stage disease. There's approvals for EGFR osimertinib inhibition, for example, through the ADORA trial in the adjuvant setting. Um, but what really is unique kind of in the academic practice as well as clinical trial options, we do have a lot of options both for neoadjuvant, adjuvant therapies based on molecular actionable mutations that we discover. With regards to your question about histology, I have actually been testing all of my patients with stage four metastatic non-small cell lung cancer, as there are a cohort of patients that have squamous histology and will have an actual mutation. And any preference over liquid versus tissue or DNA versus RNA as well? Yeah, there's a few thoughts here on this. Um, I have a few colleagues that actually just at first visit will get both a liquid biopsy and a tissue biopsy. We're kind of in this waiting limbo for patients trying to figure out what is going to be the plan of care. Do they have an actual mutation? Liquid biopsies at times can expedite the results that you get, roughly taking around a week at my institution. That seems to be the case for, for most places, seven business days roughly. Um, of course, you can't always rely on a liquid biopsy. It really depends on the tumor burden that the patient's experiencing, for example. So just because you have a negative uh, liquid biopsy and if you still have a high suspicion that your patient is, for example, a never smoker, young, and you think that they have an actual mutation, I would still wait to confirm that your tissue biopsy does not have an actual mutation. Thank you for sharing those thoughts. Coming back to the algorithm, um, looking at these options, is there a particular patient where you would consider dual IO checkpoint inhibitor with or without chemotherapy when we have single 
uh, immunotherapy with chemotherapy also approved? And does TMB play a role at all in any of this? Yeah, these are great questions. So I think for the patients that have high pd one expression, so 50% or greater, I'm less inclined to give them dual immunotherapy because we know from experience from the trials that these patients are more likely to have immune-related adverse events as compared to single-agent monotherapy. Um, so I'm more inclined to give them single-agent monotherapy with immunotherapy um, for that specific subset of patients. Uh, so who will be an ideal patient in your clinic that will get dual IO checkpoint inhibitor? Yeah, so that's a really good question as well. So I think for this subset of PDO1 high expressors, less likely to give them, but we can talk a little bit more about sort of the next subsets here. So if we move kind of to the next um, category of patients, so PDO1 positive, not high expressors, but PDO1 of 1% to 49%, um, you can see on the algorithm that we have the exact same options listed here as compared to PDO1 of 50% or higher. However, in general, for our patients who are PDO1 positive but are not high PDO1 expressors, I'm actually inclined to pursue combination chemoimmunotherapy for most of the patients. Um, the key data that we get from this actually comes from several different studies. So it really depends on your histology that you're treating. So for squamous histology, we have the Keno 407 study that looked at combining pembrolizumab with carboplatin and paclitaxel or nab paclitaxel. And in this study, we saw similar outcomes actually with the use of NAB, paclitaxel, or paclitaxel, and steroid use with the chemotherapy didn't really seem to make much of a difference in terms of patient outcomes. But then for non squamous histology, we have Keynote 189, which is looking at Pembro plus platinum and Pemetrexid, and then Empower 150, which is actually a quadruplet regimen, and they looked at atezolizumab in combination with chemotherapy and bevacizumab. Thanks. In the second line setting, we now know that TDXD is an option for HER2 mutated patients and not IHC positive like breast or GI cancer patients. I want to stress that it will be NGS that will provide this information. Can you share your experience of TDXD so far? Yeah, so this is actually a very recent approval. Um, it happened in August of 2022, so just a couple of months ago. You're exactly right. We're looking for on your next generation sequencing, your comprehensive molecular profiling, does the patient's disease harbor a HER2 or an herb v 2 mutation? Um, it's imperative that you, like you stress, that we do not look at the IHC testing necessarily for HER2 testing in non-small cell lung cancer. So these patients actually based on the Destiny Lungo 2 trial, which is actually a trial looking at dose optimization, what they did was they looked at the dose of 5.4 milligrams per kilogram. And these patients had to have received prior systemic therapy. So like you mentioned, in the second line setting is the indication now or beyond. What they found was an objective response rate of close to 60%. I think it was around 58%. Um, one thing to be aware of, and I know we've talked about it a lot in other malignancies too, is the potential of interstitial lung disease that can develop as an adverse event. Um, that occurred in about 6% of patients with this lower dose of uh, trastuzumab drexatecan. Right, that's always a dire complication that one has to be very mindful of. And then another second line target is EGFR20 mutation. Any clinical pearls for mobocertinib or amivantamab? Yes. Um, so one thing before we even get into that, I think is important to recognize, especially for oncologists practicing in the community is not only on comprehensive next generation sequencing should we be saying, yes, we recognize an EGFR mutation, but specifically paying attention to the type of EGFR mutation that you've identified. So not just the canonical, more common exon 19 deletion or the L858R point mutations, but recognizing that you do have this exon 20 insertion is very important because it does affect management. Um, and so exon 20 insertions uh, ideally kind of represent about 2% of all non-small cell lung cancers, around 9% of patients that have an EGFR mutation. And we do have approvals now for amivantamab, like you mentioned, and then mobocertinib. Amivantamab um, is given uh, through the IV. It's an EGFR met by specific antibody that was approved last year. And the mobocertinib is an oral uh, agent that we give to our patients. Um, we see objective response rates based on the trials. Uh, so the Chrysalis trial showed about a 40% objective response rate for amivantamab. The mobocertinib objective response rate was a little bit lower, it was at 28%. Um, but I think when I'm thinking about which patients to give a particular treatment to off protocol, I think about the way that it's administered. So through IV or oral, what would a patient prefer? What, how would that impact the patient's quality of life? I think about the toxicities as well. So mobocertinib is known for having more diarrhea, can be managed with imodium up front. Um, amivantamab, you really have heard about the infusion-related reactions that can occur. Um, as you know, for really the first week as well, and for the first cycle rather, it has to be given weekly. 
and it's given day one and day two, so it can be a little bit more taxing to bring the patient into the infusion clinic. I think for both of these agents, one of sort of the, the downfalls or, or the thing that we still need to figure out a bit more rather is patients that have CNS disease, right? So how well do these drugs penetrate the CNS? We know it's not as robust as osimertinib and our other EGFR patients, for example, but amivantamount is being studied in combination with third generation TKIs like lazaritinib, for example. Now, going to what you certainly mentioned about the CNS uh, penetration, now, if these patients, in fact, have metastatic disease, would you actually go for whole brain radiation therapy if they have not received and while one is administering mobisertinib or amivantamab? Yeah, so that's a that's a tough question. I don't have data to point to necessarily, but um, I think, you know, if they are symptomatic and your patient does have multiple brain metastases, you definitely need to have a multidisciplinary discussion with your team on site. So getting radiation oncology involved, discussing a plan, because like you said, and like I've mentioned, CNS, CNS penetration is just not as robust. Thanks. While we're at the second line option post ESMO, we saw data from Codebreak 200 where KRAS inhibitor was compared to docetaxel, and we saw PFS improvement, but no overall survival benefit. Has this changed your practice, or and what's your take on this? Yeah, so, so great points here. Um, so as we know, COBRA 200 was the kind of phase three confirmatory trial that looked at some sotoracid versus docetaxel in the second line setting for our patients that have KRAS, G12C, mutated non-small cell lung cancer in the metastatic setting. Importantly, these patients had to have already had platinum-based therapy and immunotherapy either together or sequentially. And what they found, like you alluded to, is that there was a PFS benefit, which was the primary endpoint, but the overall survival benefit was a little bit lackluster, if you will. Um, it actually had a hazard ratio of 1.01, so it was not significant. I was really hoping to see an overall survival benefit. Um, I think there may be a factor of crossover that might have occurred in the trial that could be contributing, but there's other factors as well. So KRAS patients, um, they're a very uh, heterogeneous sort of population. They have several co-mutations that can at sometimes affect outcomes for patients. So I think you know, I'm still using this drug in the second line setting, Sotoracid. I think, you know, the impact of quality of life is important for patients. This is an oral pill that they can take at home. They can have more time outside of infusion clinics, outside of appointments. So that's nice to offer to patients may, you know, kind of bump up the quality of life compared to docetaxel. Um, but a little bit disappointed uh, that we didn't see that overall survival benefit that we're all hoping for. Yeah, no, uh, we're all a little disappointed on that data, but at least gives us another treatment option for our patients. Exactly. Post ASCO, we saw a particular study that was presented. It was a sub-study of lung map um, where they compared pembrolizumab and ramucirumab as a second line treatment option in spite the patients progressing on chemo or IO in first line. The presenter at that time made a comment that this is practice changing and is ready for prime time. That was a phase two study. Have you incorporated that data in your practice, or do you still offer those attacks on ramucirumab in second line? Yeah, so great question. Uh, you know, usually for these patients, if I can't get a patient on protocol, um, you know, the go-to standard still remains docetaxel plus or minus Um, I was very excited by this data, but I don't know if it's quite ready to say that, yes, it's practice changing today. Um, like you said, this was a phase two study that still requires phase three confirmatory evidence. Um, but it was really nice to see kind of this potential for a chemotherapy-free backbone, if you will, for patients. Um, you did see this overall survival benefit of 14.5 months versus around 11, 11 and a half months compared to docetaxel and ramucirumab. And, um, you know, what I was really surprised about was when I talked to my colleagues, there's a lot of us that actually don't use the remisiramab in combination with the docetaxel. We'll typically just lean towards monotherapy docetaxel. But this study was impressive. You know, they had over 40 something patients out of 60, 67 in the, in the control arm that actually did get remisiramab. So I guess the negators for the study can't say it was because of VEGF inhibition that we saw this benefit with Pembro because really the control arm, a lot of the patients did receive it. No, I think that has been the case in the community as well, where uh, when we are seeing these patients, they're already so beaten with the therapy on hand. But again, the combination definitely makes a huge difference. Right. I'm actually going to dial the clock back a little, going back to PDL one uh, less than 1% here. Um, does TMB play a role? We all see a small subset population where your TPS score is low, but you still have a high TMB score. How do you tackle that in your clinical practice? 
Yeah, I often don't rely on just TMB in itself um, to make clinical decisions. You can see this disconcordance between pd one IHC testing and TMB. Um, so I often don't rely on that. Uh, really in my clinical practice and the decision making in the FDA approvals and the algorithm that you have here, we tend to follow pd one TPS. Um, so really looking at the tumor proportion score, the total proportion score rather. Once you have done the NGS testing, there was no actionable mutation for frontline targeted therapy and you utilize immunotherapy or immunotherapy with combination chemotherapy. Now on progression, do you repeat NGS testing to see if there is a development of any targeted mutations there? Not routinely. It's not really a standard that we do. I mean, I will go back and I'll look at the sample. Okay. I'll confirm that it was comprehensive next generation sequencing. We often get referrals from the outside sometimes where it may not be comprehensive. And then, yes, I'm inclined to make sure. Okay. Also, if you see progression that's a bit out of proportion or unexpected, then I would also recommend getting a repeat biopsy, considering repeating molecular testing to confirm that we really did not miss an actual mutation. And I think that repeat NGS testing can also be important if someone has first line actionable mutation, just to make sure that they've not developed any resistant gene, like what right. we tend to see with EGFR, or have they switched from ALK to something else where we can attack that particular clone. Right. And then also, you know, if you have a patient, for example, that has EGFR mutated non-small cell lung cancer and they, you know, do develop progression, you want to rule out transformation of histology as well. So that's an important thing to think about, too, if you need to repeat a biopsy, looking at the histology, confirming that we are dealing with the same type of histology. Certainly couldn't agree more. Thank you so much for taking the time to review this algorithm with us today, Dr. Singhi. We hope this discussion will reinforce the current standard of care practice for non-small cell lung cancer in our community. Thank you.